I was shooting horses one day at a, at a place up the road, and for a lady named Carrie, and uh, ends up being his ex-wife, and he goes by and he sees that I had a future three anvil and a forge, and he's like, hey, you know, because I guess he's used to seeing, you know, stall jack or whatever, and, and then uh, we just got to communicating, and then he said he was a blacksmith, blah, 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 I show up at the shop, and as you can see from the shop, I was like, oh, you're not a blacksmith, you're a blacksmith. Yeah, around here it was pretty rare to run into anybody that was doing anything hot. Um, I mean, everybody, there's uh, 10,000 farriers, but none of them had a forge, none of them had an anvil. So, and you'd see a lot of stall jacks and a lot of people that would show up with a, you know, a pair of nippers and that was about it. So, when I saw Doug out there with a forge and actually banging shoes out, yeah, I knew that that was something we had to But it was horrible. This was like six or seven years ago. So, I'd only been <laughs> shoeing for like a year and a half. I mean, I was heinous. But I was trying. I was trying. So I come to the shop and I mean, I'm working for his ex-wife, but him and I develop a friendship. I know uh, it, it just it just worked. And so I was learning how to forge. And as anybody that knows, when you're learning how to forge, you wreck tools. You you wreck tools. Yeah. It's the and he's a tool maker. I mean, if you look around the shop, he's a big fan of, I ain't going to buy that if I can make it. So he just makes tools to fit his needs, right? So I come in with a broken tool. I'm like, I bought it from, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, okay. And so he puts it back together. And most, most tools are made for the general public though. They're not made for a specific person. And Doug was particularly hard on materials because like, when he wants something done, he wants it done like now. So he used to beat the hell out of his tools. And, and you know, in the beginning too, he hit, tools on you know he'd strike metal that was black 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 like cold cold and it was really really remarkably hard on tools so we started working together and figuring it out and, and uh, farrier's work was kind of alien to me I'd always been a blacksmith more than a farrier and he was a straightforward farrier so when we got into it it was neat to me because the crossover the way that the, the blacksmith works is different than the way a farrier works in, in general I mean the blacksmith used to be the farrier but realistically they're so separate now They've developed their own unique style, so it was kind of interesting for me. I learned as much as he did about, you know, I would learn about tools and tooling, and he would, or I would learn about shoes, and he would learn about tools and tooling, so it was always kind of interesting. And that relationship progressed as I progressed in my craft. So when I was making my shoe board for my CF, I, I, I didn't know, I mean, I, I, I would ask around local help, like, hey, call so-and-so, hey, can you, can you help me? And they didn't have time, nobody had time. So... Oh, you showed, you showed up now. here with a VHS. You showed up here with a VHS on how to build. What was it a bar shoe? No, it was like the it was like the shoe board. No, it was the shoe no, board. You remember the first one? Oh, we were working on forge welding. Oh yeah. And I went and got a VHS. Like I picked up an old school TV with a VHS <laughs> built in it. You know, and we sat out here and we watched. We would how watch to build a, a video, and yeah. then he would stop, and we I would do it, and then we'd go again. <coughs> Excuse me. And this progressed through all, all the shoes, bar shoe. And then when I'm calling a rolled toe, he's like, that's a chamfered he's edge. He's chamfering the edge of the shoe. And I'm like, I don't care what you call it. We call it a rolled toe. <laughs> and, that, that and then I'm like, a rocker. He's like, well, that's a half-faced blow. And, oh, yeah, exactly. and I'm like, again, don't care what you call it. I got to learn how to make it. So he actually, underneath there, he's got an old a farrier's anvil. And that's the other thing, anvils. I mean, how many anvil stands did you make me in? Like two or three, yeah. There's so many things as a young farrier. You're a mobile rig, you know what I mean? And you can't afford a stone well and this and the other. And so you've got this little anvil well, these, these stumps and, and this and the other. They don't really fit in. So as you begin to start kind of progressing, things, it's like round peg, square hole. It just, it's yeah. it's, it's, it's it's not working. Yeah. And so we figured out a lot of different places where, where his, we're trying to work was getting hung up and snagged. So we ended up building anvil stands and building things that were easier to take down and, and reassemble and went through a couple of different configurations and, and until he finally got the stone well like, and got it set up. I mean, you're, he, originally he started off in a, a trailer. Well, it was first it was, in a, it was an old Ranger pickup truck yeah. with no camper on top and then just those, those shoe pegs that I didn't do it right. So the shoes would roll Turn off, off fall off. Yeah. I mean, I spent more time putting shoes back on a peg <laughs> than I... Like, hey, like, get so then I got those C shoes. clamps, right? I'm like, haha, I got you. So I'd go buy all these shoes. I put a C clamp on, defeat oh, the purpose, because I spend all day long unhooking C, C clamps. Oh, it was a nightmare. 
Yeah, and then, when he moved on up and got that stone well, it was a game changer. Well, then we went to the trailer, and the idea behind the trailer was now you have to pull a uh, an anvil, you know, 120 pound or whatever it was, 100, 100, how much is that future three? 110 pound. 110 pound anvil in and out of the tra trailer five, ten times a day. So he won off to me an, an anvil stand. It just, we were constantly progressing. So this new tool deal. Well, and his challenges were interesting to me because, um, I mean, it was it was a like dude. I'm a blacksmith. I my anvil weighs 700 pounds. I don't move anvils. I don't set up tools. So the idea of my anvil weighs building and tearing down your shop 15 times a day was unholy. The idea of having to move that anvil, set it up, clamp it down, set up water, set up your forge, set up, dude at 15. I'd like no, it was unreal. It's un, that's just an, an unreasonable task. You know, and this is, it, it made me twitch and cringe when you'd hear the horror stories about people pickling around over $5 or 10 or 15 or $20 on the bill, you know, and it's like, they have no idea. They have no idea the work that went in in front of that and the work that went in just to get set up to do the job. Mm -hmm. And around here, well, not around here, I mean, I think this is like global. I think this is like, you know, countrywide for sure. You know, the people that are doing this, this it for a very real period of time, it was on the brink of being a dying art. There were not a lot of people that were hard enough to do what you're doing. And there's not a lot of people that are hard enough to do what I'm doing. And there's just not a lot of people that are hard in general enough to do honest work. And um, so, I mean, there was always a part of me that wanted to support that and, like, wanted to do what I could. Because his challenges were so unique. As a tool builder, they, they really piqued my attention because, like, how do you make a tool last 10 minutes longer when it's receiving the worst abuse that you've ever seen any tool take. And part of that's because I didn't know how to use the tools. <laughs> well, Let's whatever. just be that real honest. That doesn't matter, that's, though. Like, that's the biggest... Those are the conditions like, that the tools are being used. Like in. this Atlantic 33's tool set <laughs> that we're using now. Guys are like, oh, is it indestructible? No, 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 that's not the case. You're going to wreck it. Everything You're going to trash it. You're going to... But the thing about that particular metal is you can clean it up quickly and then get back to work as opposed to, oh, I chipped a $70 tool and there's... A, because if you were good enough or if you were smart enough if you were smart enough that <laughs> if you were smart enough that you knew how to fix that seventy dollar uh, H13 or S7 steel, like if you, then you wouldn't have broken it anyways. In yeah. other words, you, you would have known not to leave it in the metal that long, or not. You know what I'm saying? Well, and, and that's my hard lesson too. Like this is a this is a power hammer punch that I was using to make an eyelet through a hammer. So and you can see the hammer bump the blank, and I seize the punch in the blank. I mean it wiggles, but it won't I just come mushroom the end of it so much that it won't come out of that blank. So I write stupid little notes like "Don't be an idiot" on it and throw it up on the on the shelf. But it was like lessons like this that taught me what steels will hold up to. So I mean, like what you're doing is this exact same thing on a smaller scale. So yeah. like it made sense to shift away from like this punch was made of H13, which is a great steel, but it, it taught me a lesson. So we came in one day and I brought in a whole bunch of tools. You know, this is after I joined the WCB, and you want to talk about when I started wrecking tools. Because not only was I trying to learn how to build the shoes... But now you're doing it on a timeline. Yeah, but now I'm putting a stopwatch on something. And then, it just... I mean, I'm trying to run fullers through the, you know, through the anvil and, and you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, when you put a timeline on something, people try to do everything they can in the least amount of time possible. Which yeah. means that you're going to take five or six extra licks just hoping you can get to the bottom of that hole. Like a blacksmith, I'm working on my own timeline. So, I mean, when the color leaves the metal... I'm going to stop. I'm going to throw it back in the fire. I'm going to get it hot again. I'm more worried about the internal grain structure. He laughs because on the forges that we have, we pile these big old mounds oh, of dude. coke up. It looks like Mount Vesuvius. It looks like a volcano. You know, I mean, they got this mound of coal. It's like taller than you, and they're just jamming pieces of metal in the sides of it. And then like we run the air as high as we can. It's and then fire we, we come out of the forge, and there's like, like I'll be covered, like whole face just black, just from standing in oh, yeah. red, like sunburned red from just living by the forge. And he's like, what are you doing? It's like, I got one hour to build this shoe and shoe that foot, I gotta get after it. it yeah, but time is money in your field though, and that's a, that's a thing, you know? Well, and, and, and progression, at one point I didn't know how to pull clips. So Pep oh, watches me, that. and he's he's watching me try to pull clips, I can't pull clips. So Pep forges a clip starter, this thing that you drop down in your hardy hole, you put it over top, you hit it a couple times, and it shears the metal down and then you can pull clips. Yeah, it would just measure, it would, you know, it just had a little notch in it that measured. I've it. seen them, they make them now actually. Do they? Yeah, you yeah, could have totally patented that. You push, you push it into the hardy, or you know, so you drop this thing in there, you push it into the hardy, and it would measure a little piece of metal, and you just drive it down, and it would pick Shear up a piece off. and just smear it down into the hardy hole. Yeah. So it just made a real consistent, 
clip. So the, the progression continues and continues and continues. So lo and behold, uh, I become a journeyman, blah, blah, blah. One day I'm wrecking tools. I come to Pep and I'm like, dude, I'm having a bad, I, I can't figure this out. So Pep, he makes and properly treats the whole nine yards, everything from, you know, H13, S7, D2, A2, just all kinds of stuff, and Atlantic 33. And we, we, we forge everything out one day. He has an oven. What was that oven? That incubator, not incubator, but that convectional oven thingy that was over there. Oh, the kiln? Yeah, that you yeah, could it set. A, well, it was could, a furnace. It was yeah. a heat treating furnace. So yeah. we, we did everything just right. Exactly what the metal says to do, right? And then I came over here and started building shoes. D2 didn't even make it through the night. It shattered. All, like, it didn't it just, make it. Yeah, the, the metals weren't designed to do yeah. what he was asking them to do. And I was trying to push him hard. Okay. Well, I mean, that's the point. It's like yeah. to try to build a tool that was going to take the punishment. And it's unique. And I can't blame myself for A33. It was taught to me by a, a master smith out of California named Brent Bailey. He's a master tool builder. He's built thousands of hammers. Um, and it's he punches the holes through the hammer. So just like you saw that one punch that I seized up, he literally has A33 punches that have made a thousand holes. This is one of his hammers. So literally an A33 punch made that hole. And he's made a thousand hammers before he had to retire a punch. And uh, it is his favorite metal for this for hot work. I just took it to an application that hadn't been used yet because it no you know nobody had ever. And asked then we for didn't it. talk about it. Oh yeah, we kept it quiet. He told me he said, because I'm like, dude, this is the great. I called him like a week later. I'm making shoes, just the greatest stuff in the world. When it when you mess it up, you just hit it with a grinder real quick and go again. He said, keep using it, run it, run it. I ran it for a year. And then finally, after heating it, quenching it, the whole nine yards, I let money beat on them. I mean, you name it, they've done it. And then finally, we just we just decided we were gonna we were gonna present the tools for other people. And again, it's not for the seasoned. Well, a guy can use it. I mean, they're great tools for that. But it's not for the guy that really knows what he's doing. It's for the younger smith that is wrecking his craft. That's exactly it. It's a you know, because if you're if you're a, a metallurgist or if you're an honest. Like, I mean, if you really know what to do, S7 and H13, they're the paramount skills the, yeah. are the, they're the best. But we were looking for something that could take abuse and still get reformed and reused. And, and it just worked. It worked out really well. It, worked out it, was, really well. it was interesting. It was a really unique experiment. And I've, we have, like you said, we have piles of different of different virtuals and punches and all kinds of stuff that didn't make the cut. <laughs> it ended up in a pile on the floor. We had a bunch that wouldn't even withstand the welding, like the connection to the handle. I remember all that. Yeah, and you're, like remember the S the S one creaser I made? It was a wooden handled creaser. Well, uh, how do you have to weld those handles onto that steel? What is that that you use? Nothing. It's just it, there's nothing special. That's the beauty of, of Atlantic thirty three is that it's a weldable tool steel. So I mean you can it's like H thirteen. So H13. normally like H thirteen or S seven you have to do like a no, special weld. You can weld H thirteen all day long. Most of my power hammer tools are a piece of H thirteen just welded to mild steel, and they take the force of a hundred and fifty pound hammer. So when you're dealing with something like this, so this little bit is made of H13, but the steel is, is mild steel. So most of these are weldable. They just have to be heat treated after welding. Mm. Well, Perfect. this tool is not magic sorcery. You're going to beat it up. You're going to ruin it. You're going to trash it. And you're going to reshape it and, and quench just, it and put it right just, back yeah. to use again. It's water quenchable. Just until, until tune you, it up. Yeah. Tune it up. Use it again until it finally has enough. But by then, I mean, you've got your money out of it and you don't feel like you just spent you know, a lot of money on a tool that you got one shoe out of. I've done it that. It sucks. It sucks. I've done that. I, I I bought a punch, got one shoe out of it, wrecked it. And I think that's the thing that, you know, there, it, there's 2,000 places you can get discouraged in starting. Starting to yeah. learn, starting to try to figure out how to forge, starting to try to figure out how the metal moves and when to stop and when to not stop and how far you can push it. And I mean, this this shop is littered with broken dreams and half, you know, half tools, and but... I don't know that that's one of the things that always sold me on Doug is that Doug was willing to get out there and work twice as hard to get the same amount of work done as everyone else because he knew that he was working towards a goal and he continued to push and continue to fight. Then it, you know it encouraged me to help and I don't know just hang out like there's not many like-minded people left around here anymore. So when you run into somebody like that, you you kind of want to yeah. sprinkle some fertilizer on that and. Not, not bull fertilizer, but regular yeah, I fertilizer. <laughs> I got you. I'm with you. I guess bullshit does grow good plants. So you did. You better. Right. Right.